Hello everyone and welcome to episode 292 of the Mark and Me podcast. As always, I'm your host Mark. Now joining me on today's episode is the film director and writer Elizabeth Blake Thomas. On today's episode, we talk about her career from the very start, all her TV and film work, but we focus on her brand new movie, which is called Hunt Club, and is out now for you to stream on all those popular services. It's a great interview, and as you know, I've been saying for a long time now, I want more females on the podcast and important women within the film business, music industry, and it's really important. So it's been great to get Elizabeth on today, and I can't wait to share the interview with you all in just a couple of minutes' time. But as always, on the intro of Mark and Me, I always love to talk about my last episode. And on episode 291, I was joined by the film director... Conor O'Hara. We got to sit down and talk all about his amazing film Kinlin and this obviously followed on from Tara Fitzgerald's interviews which was only just a couple of days before. The response to all these episodes was absolutely fantastic and I was so grateful to you all. Now just before I get to today's interview I want to give a big shout out to the sponsor of the Mark and Me podcast, Richer Sounds. Each and every month, thanks to Richer Sounds, I get to go out there and record more interviews for you guys at home. It's so important that I'm sponsored and I really make sure that it's not a forced advert. I truly believe in this company and they're really, really kind to Mark and me. So if you are in the market for a brand new TV or you're a home cinema specialist that wants a really nice surround sound system, jump on richersounds.com and treat yourself because they really are the best guys in the business. So a massive thanks to those guys for supporting Mark and me each and every month. But as I said, today's episode is a big one for me and I'm so happy that I'm joined by Elizabeth Blake Thomas. So I think the best thing to do now is to get straight to the interview. So here's me and Elizabeth talking all things film. So Elizabeth, thank you for joining me today on the Mark and Me podcast. My pleasure. Nice to be here. What I like to do with all guests, and I'm nearly at episode 300 now, is take it right back to the very start. So when you were growing up, can you remember maybe those first films you watched, maybe with your family or friends that made you fall in love with cinema? Oh, without question, because I basically wish I was Maria or I wish I was truly scrumptious or I wish I was Mary Poppins. Amazing. They were my movies. And I remember one funny story where I went to my friend's birthday party and everybody was in the other room watching uh, Freddy Krueger. And oh, I wow. was with the younger sister watching Sound of Music and Mary Poppins. So those those movies are my life. They are and- my life. Were they kind of the ones that you just wanted to then be part of? You wanted to dream of being there? It it felt like that kind of magical experience that was just so far away from reality. As a kid, you just dreamed. I remember watching The Goonies and Ghostbusters, and I'd dream about being on those sets of those films and surrounded in that environment. A hundred percent. I mean, I didn't understand the film world, but I just was watching them going, I want to be there on a mountain or I want to be trying all those sweets, you know, that the crazy Dick Van Dyke was creating. It was very much you were, it was magical. I wanted to be in a different place at 100%. That's amazing. And I suppose at that age, you're still quite young. You probably weren't thinking of trying to get a career in the film industry or anything like that. You're just enjoying being a child. But at what point was it that you decided that that was something you'd be quite interested in and kind of being behind the camera and getting involved in filmmaking? Was it later at college or school years? So it was always theatre, really. It was never actually film and TV because yeah. um, my I was a, a lead in a play at Nottingham Playhouse called uh, Lark Cries to Candleford, and I played Laura, and I just absolutely loved it. But I And then at school, I was Daisy, and Daisy pulls it off. You know, I always had the lead role, but I knew I really didn't want to actually just act. I knew I quite liked telling everybody what to do, and I had visions as directing, and it was I didn't know it was called directing at the time. You know, but I'm like, this would be a good idea if we did this, or we should do that. And so it was when I was in my teens that I set up a theatre company, a local theatre company, with all these young people, and I ran it for about four or five years, 
Then I ran something at, a, at an art center. Then I went to college, you know, but again, it was all theater, theater, theater. I had my daughter when I was 24 and she came to all my classes and it was when she was four years old that she got her big break, which was actually starring in the Green Balloon Club for CBBS, and she was a presenter. Oh, wow. But again, it's still, I still didn't think to myself, I want to be directing it. I loved what the director was doing, but I was a mum. I was looking after her. And then it was only when we came to L.A. with her acting career that people said to me, would you mind? In fact, it was with Kirsten Waring was the first actress and Craig Fairbrass in a film that my daughter was in. And the director said, would you mind going and helping Kirsten? Because you're directing your daughter. Could you direct Kirsten? Kirsten and I are very good friends. She's amazing. And I said, yeah, sure. And then someone said to me, you should be a director. And I said, how do I do that? And they said, you just say you're a director. And I did. Usually I say to people on the podcast, I've had directors like Kevin Smith, Neil Blomkamp, Neil Marshall, um, Anthony Hopkins, and all these different people. And I say to them, what advice do you give to people that want to become a director? But I suppose the best advice is just label yourself as a director and then hope for the best. It is, that's it. That's honestly, Mark. It, it was when it was a fellow director friend of mine, Sean McNamara, directed Soul Surfer, uh, as all amazing movies, actually, if you look him up. But he um, he was the one that said that to me. And this was only six years ago because it was theatre and I was supporting my daughter and she was the star. You know, she's the Disney Plus actress. She's the, she, that's what she does. And then I was like, oh, I did enjoy it, actually. Do you mean I could do this properly for a job? Well, I did. <laughs> that's such a unique story. And even though I'm at nearly 300 episodes, I've never heard a story where... It's not being film school or someone, you know, has passed down the wisdom because of their parents. You literally were, and I said this with full respect, in the right place at the right time and just thought, fuck it, why not? Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. I did. I was like, well, if if that is what it takes, I started saying it. And of course, because I had the theatre experience, I knew actors. But no, I knew nothing. My first film, I got a quarter of a million dollars for it. And um, in fact, this is all in my book, Filmmaking Without Fear because I made four in my first year, I just went for it. But the first film I did, quarter of a million dollars, and I remember the, the DP with the camera, because there was no 6K, 4K, even 2K. No. Six years has changed. And um, I said, can you put the camera over here? He said, well, not, not really, that doesn't really work. I said, well, what do you mean it doesn't work? And he explained, I said, I don't care. I think it looks really cool. And so I got him to think outside of the box because when you haven't gone to film school, there are no rules. I had another director actually that once said to me, came on my second film and he said, you know, you can't break the 180. And I was like, I don't even know what the 180 is, but I'm going to break it. And of course you can, you have to do it in certain ways. So anything is possible. I love it. And I love the fact that you're not sticking to this one hymn sheet that everyone should go off and have certain lenses at certain angles in certain environments. You were like, I suppose knowing less could be more because you could just reinvent stuff. You could try new things and sometimes they're not going to work and you might just think, well, at least we tried it. But sometimes you might be like, do you know what? Even though it practically shouldn't happen and be there and realistically that's not going to work. Just let's just try it. And if it looks great, well, yeah, there's brilliant. No fear. There's no fear at all. No. In fact, I did learn, and you learn better in that way. I did one shot in my first movie. It was really funny. I thought it was beautiful. I thought it was the most beautiful shot ever. And it was a seven minute take. And when I'm in the editing room, having never been in an editing room, he's like, well, what do you want to cut to? And I was like, what do you mean? What do I want to cut to? And he's like, well, it's a seven minute shot. All she's doing is walking. I was like, oh, that's why we cut. <laughs> And so you learn that, and I never made that mistake again. But again, you're not going to learn these things unless you really go for it. And I think having no fear is the crucial aspect of this. So we have to fast forward a bit of time. Uh, and now, obviously, at the moment, we're promoting Hunt Club, uh, which is the latest film that people will be waiting to see after hopefully listening to today's interview. And you said then about working with people and other directors and trying things out. But this time around, you're working with a stellar cast, Casper Van Dien, who's just absolutely amazing. I've met him. I've worked with him. He's brilliant. Mina Savari, who's still one of my favorite actors out there and a legend, Mickey Rourke. Like, are you pinching yourself every day on set thinking this is just unbelievable? Well, it's, it's interesting, actually, thinking even about the genre, because um, somebody here said, you know, you have to put yourself actually in a box for genres as well. And I've done rom-coms, I've done kids films, and now I'm doing this horror thriller, you know. So so 
from my perspective, I'm going there going, what can I learn? What's going to be new and different? And the actors just become part of that. They're just part of the, the whole process of what we're doing. So you might initially think, oh, my God, I watched Mina in, uh, you know, in her beautiful movie with all the rose petals. But you you don't think of that when you're directing because you have that uh, metaphorical hat on of we're here to create something together. Um, you hope that every act is going to be nice and kind and sweet. That's the most important aspect of it, in all honesty, because what you don't want in such a tight, tight frame and working together is an actor to be hard work. Um, and so that's your first initial thought. You're not going there going, oh, my God, they're a star. You're going, oh, God, please be good to work with. Please be good to work with. And they were and they are. And that is the best thing. And then once you've got through that, then you're just there to make the movie. And then you become very good friends with them. You know, that they're, they're very good friends and they're supportive of each other. And you it, it's it's a community that starts building. Because you're still quite early into your career, I think, did you say it was six or seven years since you did your first yeah. release? Yeah. What is it that you keep taking away from each film, especially the most recent with a bigger cast, a bigger budget, um, more kind of... Uh, I suppose opens on a bigger scale, but what's the thing you kind of take away and learn from each film that you think then improves for the next? Because working with such a great cast and great names, even people like, um, is it Jason London, um, who yeah, I think is a great brothers. actor. I remember him in Dazed and Confused many, many, many years ago. But um, do you do something differently or do you try something that, maybe changes throughout the filmmaking experience? Like, what would you do differently for your next film? So um, you definitely learn something. I mean, I think I've directed nearly 20 movies, you know, I've been part of maybe 25 or something like that. So you definitely learn something from every single movie you do. Um, ironically, I'd say actually one of my favorite movies that I ever did was my second movie. And that was, I went from a quarter of a million budget to 26 million, uh, to 26 million, 26,000, um, you know, which people are like, oh my God, you've gone down budgets. To me, it's not about the budget. To me, it's not about the money. To me, it's about the length of time you have to actually film it, which obviously the longer you want to film means you generally need more money. But depending on who you're working with, every film teaches you the thing that you know you don't want to do on your next movie, not what you do want to do. Yeah. So on this last one, I realized, ah, I don't want to um, not have stand-ins. I don't want to not have doubles. I don't want to not have, because you can see the benefit to all of these and I realize I want more days now when you're working with uh, these actors who need longer to you know work through scenes because you've got stunts there's a lot of stunts in this movie you just understand that a little bit more and you realize okay that's why I need to do that next time so every film definitely teaches you something as far as the kind of quality of cast in all honesty the quality of cast is always there. It's just that they're not names necessarily because those actors that turn up on every set are dedicated. They are full on ready to give you everything just because they might not be a name. And yeah. so I've had some actors actually who are definitely not names and they are hardworking um, for me because they're kind of like, no, I need this and I need that. And I'm like, oh, okay, I don't have that in this budget, but I'll try my best, you know. And you want to give everybody the um, a kind of like, um, a toolbox with which to do their best job. And obviously the more money you have, the more tools you can give them. Um, but you just keep on learning. You, every film, I don't think you stop. I'm sure Greta just learned from her $1 billion Barbie film, quite frankly. I literally watched that this um, time yesterday and it blew my mind. I don't know how they made that. It's exactly. unbelievable. Exactly. And I'm sure that that budget kept on going up. Uh, yeah. But, um, you know, you you learn from everything uh, what you're doing and who you're with. The biggest thing for me is just working with good people. I, I just don't, I don't want to work with people that aren't. Is there kind of a list in your head? I know everyone would love to work with obviously people like Robert De Niro and the big names, but is there a certain uh, group of actors that you would still have on your tick list that would be a, a hell of an achievement for you personally? I mean, for me as the podcast, there's names obviously like Simon Pegg and Cameron Crowe and people that I love in the industry that I'd love to get on. But for you, is there someone that you'd love to work with? It's a very good question. Um, 
do you know it to me it's not about thinking oh I want Brad Pitt in my next movie or Robert De Niro I, it's not about that uh, I mean one of the the women that I think going back to my initial comment of the movies I loved as a child, you know, Julie Andrews, and more because I think to myself, those talented people are not going to be here forever. Yeah. So those people, you know, Julie Andrews, definitely. I actually voiced over something for a movie and then they got her and she replaced me. So I'm like, okay. If you're going to be replaced uh, by anyone, all... that's okay, isn't exactly, it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. She was a lot more expensive than me because I did it for free. But um, <laughs> someone like Julie Andrews, but also, again, to me, it's about the story because I love I love the theater actors yeah. so Eddie Redmayne is my is my go-to for unbelievable my next film he would be the person that I go I know you could nail this I know you could and I know he likes rehearsals for a month so I'm putting in my budget a rehearsals for a month you know and then filming for a month it, it to me the quality of that is what I want in my next film if he's listening right now, hopefully then he'll get in contact, DM me and be like, I want to do this. And then before you know it, he's on set with you and then you can just buy me a beer. <laughs> oh, he will be. I've already manifested it. Today is the manifesting day. It's 8-8. Eight, eight. So, um, so I am there ready and I'm putting it out there. The film is phenomenal. It's a true story. So I'm very excited. There's a couple of films that are down on your credits as to be in pre-production. So you've got Butterfly Love and Karma's Bitch. Are those still kind of your next things you're going to be getting involved so, so, in? Yeah, the Karma's Bitch actually is, is just finished. We're just selling it at the moment. My daughter Lovely. wrote, produced and starred in it and I directed. And we have Tony Todd and Natasha Hens, who's a really great cast, and then all her Disney friends. Um, that is phenomenal. It's really great. I'm very excited for that to come out. Um, and then... Um, Butterfly Love is an interesting one because actually I've just stepped away from it. Oh, okay. um, it's Hollywood. It's been on my IMDb for too long and they haven't, they're not making it. So you have to understand when is a good time to walk away? When is a time to create space for that next project? And I actually need to put the time into my um, into this inspirational story. It's called Siku. It's a beautiful story and it really is going to be something that uh, has a huge effect on people and that's why I need the amazing cast like like Eddie there so that's that's what I'm putting my energy into now and um and that will be it's being written by a phenomenal Oscar winning uh writer so I'm very excited that's exciting and how what stage is it at at the moment you're just waiting for it to be greenlit or are you waiting on budgeting well, we're or are you in waiting... the writer's strike so yeah. unfortunately I everything's can't do on hold yeah with it as soon as the strike is over, then then I can start putting pieces in place. That's amazing. What what I do on the podcast, and I'm just conscious of time and don't want to overrun when you've got more to do. But what I do is I um every guest that's been on, and I've had Anthony Hopkins, I've had Mads Mickelson, Kevin Smith, um, literally nearly three hundred people. Everyone gets the same final question, uh, but I do put you on the spot. So what I like to do to make the podcast as original as I can is the guest that's on the actual interview gets to choose the last piece of music that's played so on every single episode the guests themselves have chosen a piece of music that means something to them so once our edited uh podcast is ready for the world to listen to what is elizabeth blake thomas's choice of music that you would like to be played out at the end of today it's the avici song that's cool i can't remember what it's called you're gonna have to edit it um 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 it's the one with the cool video with the horse um i can google this i can edit it so it yeah, sounds yeah, like yeah. you just said this... it literally but um yeah 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 the avici one and has it got horses did you say so wake me up when it's all over oh and i'm wiser and i'm older all this time wake me up it says yeah there you go i've just literally researched on youtube all i put is alvici horse and it came up with wake yeah. me up that's the one i have to sing it to get to that line <laughs> yeah do you know what though the is problem is nowadays is i know nothing about album names or song names i literally can be like oh i love that song by blur but i don't know what it's called it's number seven on the album you're like i'm rubbish <laughs> so don't worry i'll edit it so it yeah. sounds like you just went boom there we go thank you thank you thank you yeah that is the one that gives me that wake up in the morning of going let's just 
fuck it and go for it. I love it. Um, I'm sure our paths will cross again. Uh, I'm a very busy man. I'm always recording. You're more than welcome to come back on once the world's gone a bit more normal in the industry. And hopefully this project that you're talking about will be greenlit and Eddie Redmayne will be sat by you and we'll do a, a, a special. Thank but um, thank you for your time today. I hope the rest of the press goes well. And if you look at this right now, it's exactly 20 minutes. So there you go. <laughs> How's that? Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Take care. Bye. So there it is. There's my interview with me and the amazing Elizabeth Blake Thomas, a brilliant film director, a brilliant writer, and again, someone who for me has been really inspiring because you can hear that she didn't do the whole film school route. She's not... <sighs> She's not got all these ideas above her station. She's really grounded, really humble. And I love the fact that even when she's working on these films, she's so willing to learn, knows that she's still in the early stage of her career as a director. And I think someone like that, with that personality and that willingness to learn, but still have that drive and passion, is only going to go further and further within the industry. So I'm really excited to see where Elizabeth goes. Thank you so much for coming on the show and it means the absolute world to me. And I really hope that everyone that listens today goes and checks out her brand new film Hunt Club. And as always, go on markandme.com and let me know on any of my social media channels just what you all thought of it because it really means the world. Again, as always, if you really want to support Mark and me, the best way to do this is to share my episodes. It costs absolutely nothing to listen to Mark and me, and all my episodes will always remain free. But as a thank you, if you don't want to support me on Patreon, the best way to do it is just to share the episodes. I can't make it much easier. There's episodes on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram, and all I ask in return is you to hit that share button, or if you want, retweet it on your Twitter, or if you're really generous on Instagram, Instagram, put it as part of your stories. Sometimes people think it doesn't make a difference. I'm not like these big publications that can spend all this money on sponsored adverts or advertising. I rely on people that listen to the podcast that enjoy it to then share it amongst their friends. And before you know it, your uncle or your auntie or your best friend sees the episode because you've shared it, suddenly checks it out and falls in love with Mark and me and then hopefully becomes a fan for the next few years. And that's how it's become what it is today. So if you can do that, it really goes a long, long way. Also, I do have a Patreon and the link is on markandme.com or you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts for three ninety nine 99 a month. For this, you get exclusive access to an episode each and every month called The Lost Tapes, which is an interview that only you guys will get if you support me on Patreon or Apple Podcasts. But not only that, you get a welcome pack with stickers, a badge which is really rare and there's only a few left. You get a newsletter each and every month and I'm going to start doing some playlists as well and even more stuff that I can reward people to say thank you for supporting me. I truly believe that the next few months for Mark and me are the biggest that I'm going to have. It's insane what's coming up and we're leading up nicely to the big episode 300 which is going to be massive. I'm so excited and I think the next maybe three or four weeks are the most crucial for Mark and me. It's a massive thing to say after nearly six or seven years of doing this podcast but there's something that's going to really change everything with these episodes. There's some real magical stuff coming up and something that I think is on a level above anything I've done before and I can't wait to share all that with you so thank you for supporting me and until the next episode drops in a couple of days time look after yourself take care and I'll speak to you all very soon feeling my way through the darkness guided by a beaten heart I can't tell where the journey will end, but I know where to start. They tell me I'm too young to understand. They say I'm caught up in a dream. Well, life will pass me by if I don't open up my eyes. So that's fine by me. So wake me up when it's all over.
So wake me 